Oh, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for a kind invitation. Uh, I've been asked to talk about economic successes and failures, lessons for Ukraine. And I understand that most, if not all of you, are students of economics. Right? And, and uh, just to get a feeling, uh, could those of you who have heard of an economist by the name of David Ricardo please raise your hand? Oh, you have not been brainwashed in Ricardo. Well, that's good news, um, because then perhaps my message will be will will, will be less um, less radical. Uh, I started thinking about the problems of development more than 50 years ago when I happened to end up in Peru and, and wondered why the people who did, this, did the same thing that people did in Norway, like driving buses or cutting hair, why were these people who were equally efficient as those in Norway, why were they so poor? And, and uh, uh, for a long time I thought about that. I worked. 20 years as a managing director of a, of a manufacturing company that produced in three countries in Europe. And after about 40 years of, of contemplation, I, I, I uh, wrote the book that uh, uh, you were just show. So if, we, if I try to put the lessons in one single slide, Except for a few oil exporting countries, no countries have ever gotten rich without industrialization first. And this is a quote from the chief economist of the World Bank, uh, Justin Evo Lin. He lost his job uh, not too long after this. I always wonder if there is a connection. And the next chief economist of the World Bank, uh, Paul Romer uh, was also a very uh, courageous economist. His idea was the role of cities, and he started working about charters, cities. And he didn't last long either. So I think that we are in the middle of a so-called paradigm shift. Economics is changing. What people thought was wise in 1989, with the fall of the Berlin Wall, they understand gradually that it's no longer wise. Look at the United States, where both President Trump and his opponent uh, from the left agreed that free trade was no longer in the interest of the United States. Um, look at Brexit. Look at the chaos in, 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 in Europe. So when I look at the Ukrainian situation, uh, I think you have been almost brainwashed into the idea that if you only get rid of corruption, the invisible hand will take care of growth by itself. I heard uh, a Swedish representative from the European Union say just about that at, in, at the Kiev Forum two years ago. But, you know, corruption is a bad thing and theft is a bad thing. But don't believe that if you get rid of that, you will solve all your problems. You still have many problems, uh, which, you, which you share with, with, with other countries. Uh, I've been working in almost uh, 70 different countries, and of course, each country is, is, is a kind of a case study. Like on Harvard Business School, Harvard Business School, we work on case studies. But my main theoretical point here is that economic activities are qualitatively different. That's what something you probably not taught, what, what economic, classes of economics normally don't teach you, but there are three types. Those subject to diminishing returns to scale, when one factor of production is limited by nature. After a certain point, increased production will cause lower productivity, agriculture, fishery, mining, um, and there is a double curse here for, for, for these natural products. Not only do they um, 
not only are they subject to diminishing returns, they also uh, are commodities that uh, work under perfect competition. Perfect competition means that you can read in the newspaper what the market is willing to pay for your product. Uh, that is not the case for what Bill Gates produces. So if you have an improvement in agriculture, let's say the tractor is invented, then agriculture get, gets more and more efficient, but the prices fall. The prices to the consumers fall, uh, which is very different from manufacturing. And then you have those activities subject to constant returns to scale. These are most of the service sectors. Productivity varies little with the volume of production. If you have a house painter, you ask him to, buy a, to paint a house, and you say, well, how much of a discount will you give me if I ask you to, pay, to paint a second house which is, identical, which is identical to the first one? And he's likely to say no, right? Uh, because they're, they're constant returns to scale, like, like barbers and most traditional service industries. And then you have those activities which are subject to increasing returns to scale. Productivity increases strongly with a large volume of production, creating high barriers to entry and imperfect competition. And innovations tend to spread as higher profits and higher wages. This is what the French economists call the Fordist wage regime. And the Fordist wage regime was named, of course, after Henry Ford, who had a fantastic productivity increase in the early 20th century. And in 1915, he doubled the wages of his workers from two and a half dollars a day to five dollars a day. I mean, you can only do that if you're in a very profitable business, of course. Um, and people asked uh, Mr. Ford, well, why do you double the wages of your worker? This is costing you a lot of money. And he says, uh, well, I produce so many cars that I need uh, ordinary people like my own workers to be able to afford a car. That's why I double the wages. So this is a very old-fashioned way of capitalist thinking. It's not the way capitalists tend to think now, but this, this was the Fordist idea. And, and the Fordist wage regime, which ruled in Western Europe and the United States up until after the, just after the fall of the Berlin Wall, was that if the main national manufacturing industry had a productivity increase of, let's say, 4%, then wages would go up by 4%. And then the wages also in the public sector would go up by 4%, and the barbers would raise their prices by 4%, although, they, although their productivity didn't increase at all. So there's some very important links here between the increasing returns to scale activities and agriculture. If there is no industry, uh, agricultural wages stay low, and there is very little mechanization because it doesn't pay, wages are very low. But if there is a city near the agricultural activities, then uh, the industrial activities in the city will uh, attract surplus labor from the countryside. Uh, and that means that wages will tend to rise also in the countryside. And the skills of the mechanics in the city, you know, the car mechanics will also be able to go to the countryside and repair the tractors, right? So there's some tremendous synergies here be, be, be between uh, diminishing returns uh, activities and increasing returns activities. So I think it's important to understand what colonialism was about. Colonialism was, in a sense, a technology policy. And this is a quote from uh, an English economist who are not quoted anymore but he was the best-selling economist at his time. Uh, and don't worry about the racism about this. This is a racist phrase. But they did the same thing to Ireland, although Ireland is white, so they did the same thing to Ireland. That all Negroes shall be prohibited from weaving or spinning or combing of wool or manufacturing of hats. Indeed, if they set up manufacturers and the government afterwards shall be under necessity of stopping their progress, we must not expect that it will be done with the same ease that now it may. The European Union started out as 
an organization where it was understood that all nations should, have, should keep their industry. The so-called Cecchina Report, which lay the theoretical foundations for the single market uh, in the early 90s, actually uses increasing returns as the main argument. The main argument is to have for, the, for the single market is that it will create larger increasing returns. So prices will fall and everyone will get richer. Um, what was not taken into consideration was that 40 years later, uh, manufacturing industry would die out slowly in the European periphery. Right? So in Greece, uh, in Italy slowly, in Portugal most of the manufacturing industry is gone. And in a sense, uh, the European Union has become a colonial power. Right? And when the European Union interferes in Ukrainian affairs, when they protest your prohibition of the export of timber, if you export timber and import wooden furniture, you're a colony. Right? So when, they, when the European Union protests against that, they are behaving towards Ukraine as a colonial power. I think this is very important to understand. When they protest against your export due to some scrap iron, it's the same thing. You know, the scrap iron in, in the Ukraine is used to produce uh, uh, tubes for the oil industry in the Middle East. So the scrap iron doesn't go to the EU. This has really nothing to do with the EU, but they still protest. Right. And if you look at it from the inside of the EU, when did the European Union cut the last import duties on Japanese cars? December 31st, 2017. So they, they behave as a colonial power towards the periphery, and, and they still, in a sense, behave like the colonial court. They put duty on high value import from other countries. So there's a tremendous gap here between rhetoric and reality. Uh, Norway was one of the three countries that were invited to join the EU, but which said no. I voted in favor of the EU, but this was long before the Maastricht Treaty, because I thought we had to be with with, with, with a group of nations that cheated, you know, cheating in agricultural policy and cheating in, in other policy. But the interesting thing is that the three nations that said no to the EU, Iceland, Switzerland, and Norway, are the only three countries in Europe that never had feudalism. When I say this in Brussels, people get terribly upset because I think what we're seeing is, is uh, uh, a fear, what we saw then already in the 70s, was a fear that this would become like a feudal state. And Switzerland is a country which has been most subject to, 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 to feudalism in the countries around it. And uh, the most, perhaps the most important uh, paragraph in the Swiss constitution is, is the freedom from arbitrary power. And what, this is what the feudal landlords could impose on you, arbitrary power, right? And I think what the EU is giving you is also arbitrary power. Uh, arbitrariness of saying, well, not that we import any of your scrap iron, but we, we want to prohibit you to have an export duty on it. That's arbitrary power, right? So, and this is the basic Republican freedom, the freedom from arbitrary power. This guy, who was a bestseller until my students in Tallinn started writing Wikipedia entry on, on The Forgotten Economist, he, he wasn't even in Wikipedia. This is when economists were honest, right? And they didn't have the Ricardian trade theory of comparative advantage. And if you haven't heard of Ricardo, the problem with Ricardo is that he based his theory on the barter of labor hours. You know, the world is modeled with like Nations are bartering labor hours, and those labor hours are without any skills. They are identical. 
So a labor hour in the Stone Age is equal to a labor hour in the Industrial Age. So in a sense, Mr. Ricardo is, 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 is telling you to, to, to stick to your comparative, uh, any country should stick to its comparative advantage in the Stone Age, which, which is kind of counterintuitive. And I think what we have unlearned is that a core, in a, one core aspect, capitalism and communism were very much alike. You know, we think of, cam, of capitalism and communism being completely opposite systems, because one had a plan and the other one had a market. But underlying this was an economic theory by a gentleman called Friedrich List. He was a German economist, uh, uh, dated 1846. Um, to the left is a stamp from West Germany, and, to the, uh, and to, the, uh, to the left is West Germany, and to the right is a stamp from East Germany, from the German Democratic Republic, and this is probably the only hero that they had in common, Friedrich List. It's very unusual that they had anything in common, but you see him there with his train, he was infrastructure and manufacturing industry was his, was, was, was his strategy. And you probably don't know this man, but he was born in Tbilisi, and he was the man who translated Friedrich List into, in, into Russian. And he was the Minister of Finance under the last two Tsars. He, 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 he built the Trans-Siberian Railway, and his industrialization plans were taken over by the Bolsheviks. So when people asked in 1930, what are, what are the, these Bolsheviks really doing? The answer was, in economic policy, they're just following the, 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 the industrialization plan of the last Tsar. Right? And, and this, is, uh, this is really very important, because when, with the fall of, of, of the Berlin Wall, all this disappeared. You know, this was what the New Yorker magazine called the age of triumphalism. You know, uh, communism was dead, and, and the market would solve all the problems. This age of triumphalism is what came to an end with the election of Trump in 2016. I'm not, I'm not having a lot of good things to say about Donald Trump, but he took the hypocrisy out of free trade. So the pattern is almost predictable. The leading power is, no, is threatened as a leading power and they abandon the idea of free trade, but they still try to force it on others. The same thing happened with England in the early 20th century. England was lagging behind Germany and the United States, and they also uh, stopped being free traders. The same thing happened in Holland around 1750. Holland was the leading country in the world, at least outside China. Um, and they had a big financial crisis, and they also started protecting again. So the pattern of a hegemon nation losing power and then going against free trade is very predictable. So in a sense, Trump was predictable. But note that Sanders from the left is saying the same thing. Right? So here we, we have the same idea attacked from both sides. This is what, an example to show you what happens when, when, when uh, you go into diminishing returns, just to show you actually what happens. In the 60s, uh, there, there was a disease on all bananas in Central America. And suddenly, Ecuador became a natural monopoly on bananas. And I was sitting sweating when I did my thesis in the late 70s. I was sitting sweating in Guayaquil in, in Ecuador and, and digging out these statistics. And you see that uh, because of this fortunate position, Ecuador doubled the area cultivated with bananas. But the average yield per hectare, you can say, is a mirror image of the area. So the more bananas they produced, the poorer they got. Right? That would also happen in, in the Ukraine, when you have taken the best land for wheat, you're going into secondary land, and yield will fall. That's why it's so dangerous to specialize in agricultural production. Uh, same thing happened with mining in, in tin mining in, 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 in Bolivia. So then they gave up, uh, they gave up uh, extension of bananas, and you see uh, the yield goes up again. So one important economist here, 
is Joseph Schumpeter. And uh, on, on, uh, uh, on the note of further readings, I would recommend you to pick up his book. He actually lived uh, uh, for parts of his life in territory which was then Ukraine, so he's almost, uh, he's almost one, of, one of yours. Uh, his theory is one where equilibrium, economic equilibrium is not very important. What is important is what breaks equilibrium, innovations, right? So innovations is what driving the economy, but innovations in the agricultural sector behave very different from innovations in the industrial sector or these days in, in the business of, of uh, Bill Gates and, and, and Mr. Zuckerberg. So if we look at industrial production, this is uh, productivity, labor productivity in cotton spinning during the first industrial revolution. You see at the end of the 1700s, there was labor productivity increased some years by more than 25% a year, and then it collapses. Uh, at the time, there was, you had Adam Smith who said, look what free trade can do, and you had a bunch of German economists and American economists later who said, look what technology can do. Right? This is not a result of free trade, this is, this is the result of, of uh, technological change. So all nations decided they had to go into this uh, cotton spinning business, uh, it was prohibited though in, 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 in the colonies. Oh, by, by the way, the, these kind of productivity explosion you had in the 1990s uh, with information technology, it was called, it's called Moore's Law. And Moore's Law says that the productivity of the silicon chip doubles every 18 months. And that's been going on for, I think, 20 years. And now you have a similar development in, in, in solar energy. You have, uh, you can, we can harvest energy without diminishing returns, and we're learning very, very fast. So here is an example, I think, of what happened to the former Soviet Union, to a larger or smaller extent. And I think this development is what you still suffer from and what you have to try to get rid of. Uh, this is the index of industrial production in, in, in Russia uh, from 1991, there are no statistics, but from 1992 on. You see labor, uh, industrial production is cut by more than half. The same thing happened to agricultural production, which we didn't know. Uh, this is a paper I did a few years ago with, a, uh, with a, uh, an Estonian colleague. Uh, so this is the monthly accrued wages, and interestingly enough, this is the exchange rate. So the, the problem is, the real economy was collapsing. Why on earth did exchange rate go up? Exchange rate should have gone down. Right? So if the Mercedes dealers of Moscow had been setting the exchange rate, this is the exchange rate they would have wanted. And if people were trying to take as much money out of the country as possible at very good exchange rate for them to buy houses and soccer clubs in England, well, this is the exchange rate they would have wanted. But this is, was the exchange rate that killed off Russian, the Russian uh, economy, and especially the manufacturing sector. And you see, after devaluation, you see wages uh, the devaluation there in, 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 in the late 80s, where a friend of mine had saved money to buy a car, and the next morning he could afford a bicycle. You know, this, this, is, this is the devaluation. And this should have happened much before. So, so there are a lot of unexplained things that happen after the fall of the Berlin, of, of, of the Berlin Wall, and every country has a different story. I think the worst story is Mongolia. There, more than 90% of all industrial activity stopped. Right? So, so it's, it's a theme with variations, but I think this is, this is a basic theme. And uh, I came from Armenia uh, two days ago, and in Armenia, they're still suffering from this, too, and, and as, 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 as you are. So I think it's important to know history, 
why you are in the difficult position you are, it is because of this shock therapy which was followed what, with, what in my view uh, should be called uh, a colonial policy. So in the United States, we, we can clearly see this collapse of the 40s wage regime. In the mid, you, you see here until 1975, the labor productivity and increase in real wages keep pace with each other. 4% right? uh, productivity increase, 4% wage increase. And the interesting thing with that is that the share of GDP going to labor and the share of GDP going to capitalists stays the same. So, so, so an interesting thing for almost 100 years, uh, the, the share of labor and the share of capital uh, in, in the European industry and in US industry tend to say about the same. What we're seeing now is that real wages are, 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 are uh, goods producing workers are flattening out and you have the 1% taking over. Right? Uh, in the United States they talk a bit about the 1% who, 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 who owns most of the assets. I call this post-industrial uh, feudalism the power is no longer in the people who own land, the power is with the people who own the money. And that is uh, a problem for democracy and it's a problem, of course, for, for Mr. Trump. So what we have here is essentially old knowledge. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to explain to you that what I'm saying is not very radical. It has been mainstream for, for a long time. So I, when I started writing about these things, you know, I was about the only one who, who was of that opinion. Now it's, it's changed a bit. So, so when your opinion differs, differs from most everyone else's, you're probably wrong. Right? If 90% if of people uh, are against it, you're probably wrong. But then I started reading old literature and I found out that if I had been born 100 years earlier, I would have been mainstream. So I was just born 100 years too late. Or, if I'm optimistic, 50 years too early. That, that's, that's, of course, the other option. If I'm optimistic, I'm saying I was born 50 years too early. So, uh, the first best-selling economic books was Giovanni Botero, uh, The Greatness of Cities, which totally dominated uh, the European uh, uh, economic setting uh, during the 1600s. He died in 1617. Uh, his clues to wealth was manufacturing added value and diversity. So he would say, well, you have to see the difference between a heap of logs and a heap of stones and a house. You have to see the difference between a marble block and what Mr. Michelangelo did with that marble block. And that added value between the marble block and the, the piece of art between the raw materials and the house, between the raw materials and the manufacturing industry, this is the key. And interestingly enough, in the 1970s, this was added value ID was a main theme of UNCTAD, United Nations uh, Commission for Trade and Development, and diversity. So he said, if you want, Potelo said, if you want to know uh, the wealth of a city, uh, go into the city and count the number of professions. The larger the number of professions, the richer the city. Well, if you do this now in, in Kampala on the one hand and London in the other, it still works. You know, this, 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 uh, and it's the degree of division of labor, of course. So, uh, Botero was born kind of halfway between Turin and Genova, if you imagine the map of Northern Italy. And, and they had an international conference uh, celebrating his, his, uh, the 400th uh, anniversary of his passing away in, 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 uh, in 2016, uh, two, uh, 2017. And uh, the only reason the conference was international was because I was there, right? Uh, he was remembered locally, but, but what he did in, rest, in the rest of Europe was not, has not, had not been discovered. Last year there was a thesis in Cambridge in England on the role of the influence of Johnny Botero on English thinking 
And the, 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 the uh, answer was that the most important English philosopher of the 1600s, uh, Francis Bacon, really got everything from Botero. So he is an unknown, at the unknown origin of, of, uh, of Europe. He wasn't translated into Ukrainian, but he was translated into Polish. And then you have another Italian economist who adds uh, a theoretical part. Antonio Serra in 1613 is the first to differentiate between increasing returns and diminishing returns. And he also emphasizes the division between the financial sector and the real economy. So it was, would be Mr. Draghi, you know, fooling around with the financial variables if they don't touch the real economy doesn't help. Best regards, Antonio Serra, 1613. He, he actually says that, you know, uh, that, that if, you, if you just work on the financial variables and they don't touch the real economy, it, 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 it won't help. So uh, this theory was born uh, out of the failure of Spain. You know, Spain received a lot of gold and silver from Mexico, from Peru, from Bolivia, but Spain itself got deindustrialized and all that gold and silver ended up in a couple of places in Europe, in, 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 in Venice, in Florence, in Amsterdam. And, and this is the title of the book, a brief treatise on the causes that may uh, make gold and silver abound also where there are no mines. So the question was, the mine owners, uh, I mean, those who ran the mines didn't get rich. They even got deindustrialized, the Spaniards and the gold ends up where there is diversity and manufacturing. This rule still applies, uh, but it's not, uh, I think it's, it, it's slightly coming back in fashion again. I was asked by the OECD last year to write uh, the history of economic policy since the birth of the OECD after World War II, and, and, and I was surprised that they would ask me. And, you know, these, it means that, that uh, this almost swearing in church is, 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 is becoming is becoming uh, publishable. And another example of this is uh, I'm in a sense comparing what happened to the Ukraine and what happened to the Eastern Bloc after the fall of Berlin War, what happened to Germany in 1945. So Germany had started two wars in less than 100 years. So obviously they had to be punished. And Henry Morgenthau Jr., who was the um, Secretary of State of the United States, wrote a book in 1943 called Germany is Our Problem. And he wanted to punish Germany by deindustrializing them. That was the worst, uh, that, 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 that was the worst uh, pun punishment they could think of at the time. And then what, what you saw after the deindustrialization of Western Germany, that you saw David Ricardo's wage law observed. I think here is where Ricardo is right. The natural wage level is subsistence. You know, why should anyone pay workers more than they physically need to show up for work the next morning? Why should they? Only because they're forced to by the labor unions, if you ask me. So what happened was that this Morgenthau plan was in the British zone, in the French zone, and in the American zone in West Germany, but it was, was, it was not. It was not in the Russian zone. So people started leaving West Germany because there was still industry in East Germany, so the population was leaving capitalism and went over to communism for reasons of, 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 of labor. So this shocked uh, the United States enormously. Uh, and President Truman sent out Herbert Hoover, was a wise old president from the 30s who had been in Germany during First World War I. And he, he writes back to Washington. There is the illusion that the new Germany left after annexations can be reduced to a pastoral state without industry. It cannot be done unless we exterminate or move 25 million people out of it. Using the word exterminate in 1947 was a very strong word. 
What I'm claiming is that uh, the migration pressure that you are subject to is for this very reason. Right? Because you are getting deindustrialized, and Herbert Hoover's uh, observation of, of Germany it actually applies to you as well. It clearly applies in Armenia, right? who have uh, for a long time had a migration problem. So the Marshall Plan, which was the opposite to reindustrialize Germany, was launched a few months later in June 1947, and they created the Havana Charter, which is an international, which was an international trade agreement, which said that, well, if you have unemployment, you can industrialize. If you have an industrial plan, you can industrialize. So what, what we can, what, what, the only thing we have to do to solve the problems of industrialization in the periphery is to go back and say, re-establish the Havana Charter. Right. So, so it, we don't have to re reinvent any wheel. You know, the, the wheel has, was invented and, 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 and it was there. So Hoover linked the economic structure, the population carrying capacity, and migration. If you're in the Amazon, one to two persons per square kilometer is, is, is a lot of people. Uh, in agricultural society, in normal society, which isn't terribly fertile, 40 persons per square kilometers is enough. I worked in Eritrea, and when the population of Eritrea gets up to about 45 per square kilometers, people start leaving. And where do they go? They go, from, for example, to Holland, where there are 400 persons per square kilometer. So 45 is too many in Eritrea, but it's no problem in Holland. Right? And this is, this is also, if you look at your own migration with these eyes, I think you'll see that you, you, you will see the parallels. And another interesting thing about agriculture, of course, is that, is that if you look at the most efficient farmers in the world, in the European Union and in the United States, they are heavily subsidized. So if we just ask ourselves a question, why do the most, the most efficient farmers in the world need so much protection and so much subsidies? Well, then you understand that you can never get rich from agriculture because of the two mechanisms I've been talking about. So only nations with a large manufacturing sector, a large sector with activities subject to increasing returns, it could also be high-tech services, are able to feed a large population. And I think these are the, um, you know, the pressure on the United States, migration pressure from the United States is to a large extent a result of the industrialization of Central America. And when NAFTA opened, the first thing the United States did was to dump uh, large quantities of, of, of corn, uh, of maize, in Mexico. So the subsidized American maize made a lot of uh, subsist subsistence farmers in Mexico go bankrupt. And if you look at when migration really started from Mexico, it's after this happened in the, in, 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 in the late 90s. So in a sense, uh, the migration, immigration problems that the United States has is to a considerable extent a result of their own doings. Right? It's, it's, the, it's like, like the European Union who want to dump their agricultural products on you, but you don't you know, hardly allow any or allow not enough to, to, to be bought back. So there's similarities here across. So a key insight from George Marshall is uh, when he presented the Marshall Plan, um, there's a face of this matter which is both inter interesting and serious. The farmer has always produced the foodstuff to exchange with the city dwellers for the other necessities of life. And then he says, this division of labor is the basis of modern civilization. You know, it probably started around Mesopotamia, 1500 BC, but th that's a very theoretical statement to come from, to come from Mr. Marshall. Uh, Hoover was a mining engineer, and he, he, he got the practical thing. George Marshall was the first five-star general in the US forces. He'd been in charge of logistics for all US forces during World War II. 
which must have been a tremendous task. So, so uh, people are, these people are not economists, but they saw, saw things, I think, very clearly. This is when he announced the Marshall Plan, June 5th, 1947. And they reindustrialized Germany, but while they were at it, they reindustrialized a whole sanitary belt, as they would call it, from Japan, Taiwan, Turkey, Southern Europe, Western Europe, all the way up to Norway, they, re, they industrialized them heavily and they created a barrier against communism. So what they understood that the way to stop communism is to make the neighbors of communism very rich. So, so they, the, the, the Russians won't have a chance because they, 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 the neighbors, you know, the West is so, so much better off than, than Russia. And this was a fantastic plan, very successful plan. But of course now, when the Soviet Union is gone, there is no need to, to, to follow that. Now we can let wages fall. I'm, I'm, I'm being, being a bit cynical, but I think that's, that's the way it is. So from a strange point of view, communism was useful because it made the capitalists behave decently because they knew there was an alternative. Now, like M Margaret Thatcher said, there is no alternative and, and, and we can let wages go down, no, no, no problem. You know, having a border, Norway had a, a border with Russia and we were scared stiff. You know, we were re literally scared stiff of communism during the Cold War. So I'm not defending it, I'm just saying with, with uh, on uh, aftersight, it, it actually served a purpose, which is, which is kind of, kind of uh, uh, surprising. So this is something that has been known for a long time. Um, uh, an Italian economist uh, in 1770 wrote, from manufacturing you may expect the two greatest ills of humanity, superstition and slavery to be healed. I've been dealing with the Muslim Council of Singapore because they published my things. And I'm thinking of the, the difference between the Muslim Council of Singapore and the Muslims in the desert. Right? So it's, it's, it's not really only religion, it's also what you produce. So superstition and slavery is coming back when industry, when industry leaves. And Galliani was not anybody, uh, Friedrich Nietzsche, the, the the, 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 the important philosopher said that Galliani was the wisest man of his century, which is quite, quite a recommendation. So if you say, well, how did this uh, Cold War development state work? Well, I'm using Sweden as an example because Sweden is, 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 is it's, it's so easy to explain because there were really only three people essentially involved. Marcus Wallenberg, who was the richest man in Sweden, he owned most of the industry, he, he owns, uh, owns Skandinaviska Enskilda Banken, which was the biggest bank, and he employed a Schumpeterian economist, Erik Damen, who worked in the bank, and they had lunch every Wednesday. I have this from Mr. Damen himself. He had lunch with Wallenberg, and, and Damen presented his, what he called growth poles, which was later called clusters. He wanted Sweden to be number one in certain industries, and one of them was uh, cars and buses, you know, Volvo, Saab, trucks, etc. And the other one was washing machines and refrigerators and, and, and these branches. So also Mr. Wallenberg had frequent contact with Mr. String, and Mr. String was a minister for 27 years, and he came from the poorest from the, from the poorest section of Sweden. He was almost like a feudal farmer, right? And Wallenberg and Streng, you know, behind the scenes, <laughs> we're, we're talking. And, and Mrs. Streng said to Wallenberg, yes, I like your plan, no problem, as long as we, the workers, get a piece of the cake, right? So go ahead with the industrial plan, but make sure, he probably didn't use the word, the Fordis wage regime, but when, when capitalists start making money, labor must make money too. And, and they agreed on that. So, so this was essentially uh, what John Kenneth Goldbraith, the American economist, called a balance of countervailing powers. You had big business, Wallenberg, big labor, streng, and big government, 
So this is how the United States was working in, the, in its glorious years, in the 50s and 60s. And the marginal taxes in the United States in the 60s, late 50s and 60s, under Eisenhower, who was not a communist, he was the general who won the war, marginal tax rate was more than 90%. The marginal ta tax rate only hit at extremely high incomes, right? But still, the idea was that if you made a lot of money, well, you should share with, with the, uh, with the uh, uh, you, you, should share, you should share with the rest of society. And when young uh, progressive Americans are criticizing the tax rate and some of them, somebody call them communists because they want a high tax rate, they say, well, we're not as communist as Mr. Eisenhower, you know, because we don't want 90% tax rate, we only want 50, right? So it's, I think, important to understand how, um, uh, how different uh, the world was from, from, from today. And we tend to unlearn it. This is a graph made by Branko Milanovic who was a former chief economist of the World Bank. Maybe not perfect numbers, but it's the best we have. You see some countries there to the left, Ukraine, Montenegro, Georgia. These are the red countries were richer under communism than they are now. It's kind of logical. It's, you know, it's, it's, it's better to be an inefficient lawyer in Kiev than to be the best dishwasher in Kiev, right? So the logic is it's, it's better to be less good at something advanced than extremely efficient at something which is extremely simple, right? And uh, if you look at the countries who are doing relatively well, Belarus is one of them. So in Belarus, um, they have had a very success successful industrial policy. It's not because Lenin is there on the square. You know. It's not because of Lenin. It's because they're not democratic. Because democratic countries have to listen to the World Bank and the IMF. And the World Bank and the IMF give you the kind of Cold War economics that it doesn't matter what you produce. And that's wrong. So my point here is that to be, to be a democratic country is you, you have severe, uh, severe punishment that you have to listen to the World Bank and the IMF, who are wrong. No rich country ever listened to that kind of policy in the transition from being poor to being rich. So um, if you go to Belarus, which I did uh, last year, you find that they have some old-fashioned industries, yes, uh, but they also have, on largely private in initiative, a very important in, uh, IT uh, sector. And, and I had a, the man who created that was later sent to Washington as ambassador and I had a long talk with him and, and it was interesting how this very authoritative government could work with something that was uh, private enterprise. And there's a Swiss company wanting to sell railway stock, railroad cars to Russia and they're establishing themselves in Belarus because they think it looks more stable than Russia. So, so it's strange that Belarus, which politically is such, I would say, a, a very bad system, actually manages to, 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 to produce uh, more welfare than bigger countries uh, with a bigger chance, like the Ukraine. This is a comparison of the wages of Ukraine and Belarus. Don't look at the ups and downs. This, the ups and downs are just the exchange rate to the dollar, right? So look at the difference between the two curves, right? So you see there, down to the left in the early 90s, uh, Ukraine tended to be richer, but then as time goes on, you see that in 2017, uh, Belarus, wages in Belarus are 50% higher than those in the Ukraine, right? So there is, the, 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 there is a lesson from all of this, and that is that Mr. Ricardo and his theory of comparative advantage was, was uh, uh, it was really marginal for a very long time. Um, I can, I'll finish soon.
Look at this. This is David Ricardo's idea of comparative advantage, which was created in 1917. And you see there, nobody listens to him. He only comes into, uh, this is an n-gram, you know, ch uh, chasing uh, the frequency of words in all the books that Google has ever Googled, right? So it's, it's a large data. You see, it only comes into, into discussion in the, in the 20s when the planned economy comes up, but then it really booms during the Cold War, you know, during the, when the Cold War starts in the late 40s. And it peaks around the time of, of, of the Cold War. I think the communists had a utopia, which was to each according to need and from each according to ability. And David Ricardo's theory of comparative advantage became the counter utopia. They said that, well, if just everyone specializes according to their comparative advantage, we will get what Paul Samuelson called factor price equalization. Wages will tend to be the same all over the world. The cost of labor and the cost of capital would tend to be the same all, all over the world, whether it's Stone Age or Bronze Age or, or, or whatever. And this came in two articles produced in 1948 and 49. And you see how it takes off. It becomes the credo. It becomes the utopia of the West. And interestingly, when the fall, when the Berlin Wall falls, well, economists gradually stop talking about it. It is as, as if, oh, we won the war. We don't need that propaganda anymore. So let's stop writing about it. So the demand factor is very important in economic development. Economists tend to produce what is in demand, like everyone else. Everyone has to follow what's in demand, even economists. So when there is demand for a capitalist utopia, well, they produce it. They produce the theory. And I think now the important thing for, 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 for your country is that you have to catch up with what's happening in the West. You know, they are feeding you the theory of the Cold War. Uh, don't you know, sell logs, not sell wooden furniture, etc., etc. And I wrote a paper for the, uh, for the uh, European Union last year on they have this idea of smart specialization. And smart specialization, I think, is an interesting term because it, 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 it also means that there is the opposite. There is stupid specialization. So I used in my paper uh, Ukraine as an example. Well, this is just one example. If you sell wheat from the Ukraine to Italy for 400 euro a ton and buy spaghetti back at 4,000 euro a ton, that's stupid specialization. Back to Botero, add value to your own raw materials. And I think this is what communism and, 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 and capitalism had in common, and I think we have to reinvent it. Thank you.